Welcome to We The Kids. Hi, I'm Judy Frazier, president and founder of We The Kids. We The Kids puts God back into America's history. Listening to We The Kids radio show will inspire you and your kids to have a positive American identity, clear direction, and a powerful purpose for your life. Thank you for listening. Welcome to We The Kids Radio Show for kids from 8 to 108. I am Arch Hunter, a father, a husband, and an historian. And I'm Lydia Nuttall, a mom and executive board member for We The Kids and author of Forgotten American Stories, Celebrating America's Constitution. And later on in the show, we're going to hear from the We The Kids Liberty Players. The mission of We The Kids is to put God back into America's stories to help American kids be proud to be an American, to love and defend America's Constitution, and learn the principles of freedom that establish unprecedented freedom in our country so that they can preserve freedom in America. And that is so important. That's why we're doing this show. So we're glad you're listening. Today's forgotten story is how did your ancestors achieve success here in America? And remember, because on earlier shows, we talked about our ancestors coming to America for many different reasons and choices, whether it's freedom of religion or opportunity or persecution to make a better lives for themselves, which we know as liberty and liberty gives us the opportunity. And, you know, during the Civil War, One third of the Union Army consisted of immigrants who fought alongside each other because they believe in the principles and stated in the Declaration of Independence and wanted to make America a land of opportunity for all. And Lydia, a very large percentage of our troops during the revolution were also immigrants to America. Yeah, they were. They were. So how did our early ancestors achieve success in America? That's a fascinating story because there are so many stories of success. So please begin to share with us the gift of liberty that our country has to anyone who comes here for opportunity, for education, for peace, for comfort, for future generations to continue to have their family live in peace. So what are some of the stories of the immigrants that came to America and why they came? Well, one thing that I found was a common factor. It didn't matter what country they came from, but they were all willing to work back in the day. And maybe to some of us, that's a four-lettered word. But honestly, it's a blessing to be able to work and to live in a land where you can do the work that you love or that you're good at, rather than work that someone dictates you that you have to do. or They used to have to work before America in other countries because they didn't have the liberty that we do here. It was all they could do to work the land to just provide food, clothing, and shelter for their family. That was it. There were no other opportunities. That's why so many came here for an opportunity to get an education is because they had to work so hard just for bread on the table and a roof over their head and minimal clothing to wear because they had to pay taxes, exorbitant taxes to whoever was ruling over them, or they didn't even own the land land that they worked on because you could only own land if you were part of the aristocracy or the higher up people could only own land. I mean, you could never really get ahead. It was just a meager, exhausting existence for so many people that lived across the sea. So they were so excited to come to America where they could have the freedom to work and do what they love, what they were good at. And when you're doing work that you love and that you're good at, what happens, Arch? You succeed and you're happy and you want to continue to make your life better and encourage your children or your family 
to continue to have their lives be better. And most importantly, Lydia, that all stems from we have hope. Yeah. And, hope, and, and when we have hope, we continue to try to better ourselves, help our children out so that they can help their children out. So what America gave immigrants and gave us all in our freedom is we have hope for what we want to do with our lives. Which is beautiful. You know, when you don't have hope, that's despair. That's not happy. That's grueling. Life becomes grueling. But America offered people a light at the end of the tunnel. And they were willing to work hard for that. A lot of them, their work was grueling, even here in America. Hard, hard work, sweat, sometimes really awful circumstances in which they found themselves in, in that work environment. But because, like you said, they had hope for something better, they could work through that and finally pull themselves out of that because they had the freedom to create the life they wanted. But work, again, was the common tie that connected a lot of these forgotten stories that, that I found. These people, it, work is what connected them together that helped them succeed and, and be able to pass on something better to their children who were able then to use liberty and all these opportunities that liberty in America affords to even increase their standard of living even more and then pass that on to their children and more and so forth to the point where, hey, we all have cell phones, whether you're eight to 108, um, we have microwaves, we have washers and dryers, we don't have to do things by hand, we have cars instead of horse and wagon, we can send men to the moon, we've got satellites, we have, oh, we have a TV sometimes in every single room. I mean, we are so blessed with prosperity in this country because of the blessing of work and of passing that on. We don't progress if we don't work. In essence, we that's a new kind of slavery. Mm -hmm. We mentioned in one of our earlier shows, you know, yes, there was slavery in America, you know, the the the, the chains, the shackles, the the whips, you know, that kind of slavery. But today it's almost like we have a, a new mental slavery where we don't want to work. We feel like we are entitled to a paycheck from the government or entitled to free this or free that. But there's a blessing in being able to work and earn these things. And that is the American dream that was passed on. That's what we want to preserve and teach our kids to work. And that's a source of, of happiness to watch yourself and your status in life go from point A to point B because of what you are doing you know, one of my favorite historians, Lydia, says that America is the blessing of hope. And in one of our shows, you talked about the Statue of Liberty and the torch that's there. And uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush, uh, President number 41, stated one time that the torch in the Statue of Liberty is made up of a thousand points of light. And we need to share those thousand points of light throughout our country and throughout the world. And could you share a few of those stories with us about immigrants that came here and their success that they had as yeah, one of those absolutely. thousand points of light? Yeah, I love that thousand points of light because there are six people in the Forgotten American Stories that I researched. I wanted to find someone representing different nationalities that came to America and share how they worked to get from point A to point B. And one of these is Sarah Breedlove. That was her birth name. She became later on in her life, Madame C.J. Walker. Madame C.J. Walker. So she was African-American. She's the first freeborn in her, her family. She was the fifth child and was born free right after the Emancipation Proclamation, right after, you know, that 13th Amendment came into effect, making slavery illegal in America. And she has an incredible story because she became America's first self-made female millionaire. African-American in the 1800s. She was born in 1867. So this is what's cool about her story, because her story gives me hope 
that no matter what my circumstance, no matter what circumstance that I'm born in or throughout my life happens to me, you know, at adversity and whatever, that you can overcome it if you're willing to work hard. And as long as we have that liberty, that hope that Arch mentioned, that hope shining at the end of the tunnel um, that we might be in. But she was actually born on a cotton plantation. As I mentioned, she was the first freeborn in her family. She was the fifth child. She was orphaned at age seven. Both her parents passed away when she was seven years old. So she went and lived with her sister and her brother-in-law in Mississippi. She wound up picking cotton. At 10 years old, she was already picking cotton. Apparently, her sister's husband did not treat her well at all. So to get out of that scenario, she got married at age 14 she had a daughter, a baby girl at age 18. Then her husband died when she was 20 years old. She's a widow, okay? I mean, <laughs> adversity in her life, yeah, she's got a lot of it. Uh, she wound up moving to St. Louis to be closer to her brothers who were barbers there in St. Louis, Missouri. She worked as a washerwoman for $1.50 a day. Hmm. She attended public night school. So, so far, Arch, has she had her taste of work? Oh, yes, absolutely. She, she's been sweating um, and really working hard. She met her husband. Her husband is Charles Joseph Walker. So if you're wondering how she got the name or the popular name, Madame C.J. Walker, is because she adopted her husband's name, Charles Joseph. There's where the C and the J come from. And he was in the advertising industry. Apparently, back in the day, there was a scalp disorder among African Americans where they would lose a lot of their hair. And because of that adversity, now we women pride ourselves on our hair, man. I mean, you know, we want beautiful hair. And when if you're losing your hair, that's that's it's hard when you're a man. Oh my goodness, I can't imagine what it was like for a woman back then. <laughs> but because she lost a lot of her hair, she started experimenting with different home remedies to, to fix that problem, make her hair grow back again. And uh, she and her husband started promoting her products because she actually found something that worked. Um, she actually went door to door initially to others in her community with her daughter and they would uh, teach the, the people, the homeowners, you know, hey, this is what happened to me. This is what I've discovered works for me and I'm offering at a really good price. You know, however she did it, she started promoting her hair care products that way. And then her husband got on board. She um, wound up becoming so successful, but you know, with her husband's help, that she opened a factory and a beauty school in Pittsburgh in 1908. In 1910, the founder of We the Kids Would Love This, because she lives in Indiana, but in 1910, Madame C.J. Walker moved her business to Indianapolis, Indiana. And at this point, she was making about $7 million an hour, wow. we would say it would be in our day. Can you believe that? $7 million, okay? Wow. So work, 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 work is what pulled her from a life of picking cotton being married at 14 years old, being a single parent and widowed at 20 years old, you know, working as a washerwoman, $1.50 a day. I mean, work is what pulled her through. And that is what's so amazing about America is she had the freedom and the opportunity to do this. And she took advantage of it. And I'm sure she had obstacles all along the way. And, and we've discussed many of them. And but she they, pulled through it. There's a mini series that was just made this past March about her called Self Made. I don't know oh if you my. know that. And of course, there's some historical inaccuracies in it, but the 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 crux of the story is, is very true to her life. And one of the things that I saw with Madam C. J. Walker is she passed on her opportunity to a lot of other women to help them create their own businesses so that they could be prosperous. So she I love that. She wasn't You're right. She, she started franchises for women all over the country and to own their own beauty shop, to own their own, you know, little company where they could also be successful. So she wasn't absorbing all of the success into herself, but she was spreading that out to a tremendous amount of women all throughout America. And even more powerfully, when we think about that time period, women did not own their own businesses then. Yeah, which, so true. She helped create that opportunity for so many other women in America, which I just found fascinating about her story. 
Yeah, she broke a lot of molds, didn't she? And her husband helped her. I love that too. With the support together, they were a team in developing this business and developing this factory. And I did love, in fact, I started thinking of Mary Kay when I was reading her story because yes, you're right. She did mm -hmm. train other women on these hair care products that she developed and how to sell them and how to present themselves and how to market them. And so I just thought that was, such a beautiful story. Thank you for reminding me that, yeah, she did. She trained others and duplicated mm -hmm. herself so that others could so other find people. the blessing of success too. She and, was a philanthropist. And Lydia, I know a lot of men today that could probably still benefit <laughs> from her hair products because a lot of my friends are now combing their hair with a handkerchief. So <laughs> is there another story that you would love to share with us in these fascinating stories of, of these people? Yeah, I'll share another one. Um, before we go there, if you Google, if our listeners Google Madame C.J. Walker, you'll find some pictures. There's one of her hair care products back in the day that, like, again, this is in the 1800s. It says Madame C.J. Walker and then Wonderful Hair Grower is the product name on, on the packaging wow. of this one wow. product that was on there. So that was fascinating. So maybe her remedy is still in existence and you men can benefit from Madame C.J. Walker's efforts and, and work in promoting and, and developing that product. So, so, um, so yeah, another story. I love the story of Herbert K. Pillalau. He's actually a private first class is his title because during the Korean War, he was actually Hawaiian, a Pacific Islander, and he earned the Medal of Honor. He's the first Hawaiian to receive the Medal of Honor. And his story and uh, working really hard to preserve our country, uh, preserve freedom, led to ultimately him sacrificing his life serving in the Korean War. And some of the little facts that I discovered about him opened up a beautiful story about his life. So he was one of 14 kids. Wow. Woo! Holy guacamole. His siblings shared that he was a sweet boy who couldn't hurt a fly. So he's about six feet tall. He was a quiet, unassuming child. He loved classical music. He read the Bible. So if that gives you kind of a flavor of his childhood, because this story begins when he was about 22 years old. He had the opportunity to enlist in the military during the time of the Korean War conflict. And he could have professed based on his religious views uh, and not served our country. It kind of didn't really fit his personality or his character to fight. Like I said, he was, uh, you know, loved classical music, quiet, unassuming child, couldn't hurt a fly, but he felt driven somehow inside to join the military and fight for the freedom of others. So he was enlisted and the story begins where he was in Korea and his unit, they were on top of a hill where they had the advantage for a time, but soon discovered that they were being surrounded by the North Koreans. And this is his character. I love this. He worked so hard to preserve his unit that he told his unit, his, his men, his buddies, you guys retreat. I'll hold our position here on top of the hill and keep our enemy from advancing further while you guys have a chance to escape. So while all his unit is escaping, he used his automatic weapon to fire into the enemy. When he ran out of bullets, he used all his grenades. When he used up all his grenades, he threw rocks. And then finally, when, when they were gone, he and, and now the enemy's upon him, this lone soldier on top of this hill, he used his trench knife and his bare fist to fight, to give his men time to escape. When they found him later, when they found his body later, there were about 40 of his enemies dead around him. And here's the beautiful part, is his mother had a dream the night of his death where he came to her and told her that his time had come. So that when it was announced to her and her family that, guess what, your son, PFC Herbert K. Pillalau, has passed away, she was prepared. Isn't that a beautiful story? It's an amazing, just an amazing story. 
Um, and Lydia, usually we stop and have a quote from one of our founding fathers, but as we're coming near our time, let me give you a different quote from President Teddy Roosevelt, who was the first president to leave the shores of our continent. When he left our continent and he was asked why he is doing that, he said, we Americans are the stepping stones of freedom to the world. Ooh, I love that. And he wanted to have American influence throughout the world, not only because of our economics, but to influence the world towards that freedom. And you shared two stories of how literally two stepping stones that has influenced future generations and people all around them because of their freedom and opportunity. So thank you for sharing those. And I would like to hear more of those stories in other shows if you would be willing to do that. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So again, we invite everyone from 8 to 108 to please come and join We The Kids radio shows to hear more forgotten stories and to learn the principles of freedom so that we can all, whether we're 8 to 108, preserve our freedom. So something to ponder this week. What would your life be like if no one worked? What would your life be like if your liberty to work was taken away? And what would it be like if your liberty to keep and use what you earned was taken away or dictated to you? Ooh, I could tell already I wouldn't like that at all, based on experience. All right. Well, we invite everyone to check out the We The Kids website. It's wethekids.us. You can find additional stories, insights, and activities that you can do with your kids to help them be proud to be American and to love and defend America's Constitution. You can also send in your family stories to WTK at wethekids.us about how you or your relative came to America, and we'll post it on the We the Kids website. And don't forget, you can purchase Forgotten American Stories celebrating America's Constitution on the wethekids.us website or on ForgottenAmericanStories.org. We thank you so very, 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 very much for supporting We the Kids. And now we look forward to hearing what the We the Kids Liberty Players are up to. It's time for the We The Kids Liberty Players. Hey, what are you watching? Shh. It's time for You Can Look It Up. The game where you don't know what you don't know. Great, let's watch. Welcome to You Can Look It Up. The game where you don't know what you don't know. And now, here's the star of You Can Look It Up. The one... The only you knew. Thank you. Thank you. Please welcome our contestants to You Can Look It Up. Wayne describes himself as an amateur astronomer, a night owl with a dark sense of humor. <laughs> Stu Cook. Stu says he's a bit of a foodie with a taste for American history and an appetite for trivia. Finally, we have Libby Smith. Libby describes herself as a professional student majoring in abstract justice with a minor in juvenile detention. And now for round one, the question is worth $500. Who was the first president of the United States? Was it A, George Washington? B, Benjamin Franklin, C, John Hansen, or D, Abraham Lincoln? George Washington? I'm sorry, Wayne, that was incorrect. The question goes to Libby. Abraham Lincoln? No, I'm sorry, Libby, that is incorrect. Stu, for $500, can you tell me who the first president of the United States was? It was, um, John Hansen. Correct. To clarify, John Hansen was the first president of the Confederation Congress under the Articles of Confederation. He was also referred to as the president of Congress since the Articles of Confederation had no executive branch. Each president of Congress served a one-year term until the ratification of the new Constitution in June of 1788. That sound means the bonus round. For an extra $500, Stu, can you tell me how many presidents of Congress there were under the Articles of Confederation? Eight. That is correct. 
of the most well-known presidents of Congress were Richard Henry Lee and John Hancock. Now moving to round two, the question is worth $1,000. Libby, what day did the Continental Congress pass a resolution to declare the colonies free and independent state? Was it A, April 1st, 1776, B, February 2nd, 1776, C, July 4th, 1776, or D, July 2nd, 1776? The 4th of July, 1776. No, I'm sorry, Libby. That is incorrect. The question goes to you, Wayne. July 2nd, 1776? That is correct. The Continental Congress on July 2nd passed the Lee Resolution, also known as the Resolution for Independence. It was proposed by Richard Henry Lee on May 15th, 1776. Well, it looks like we have a tie. And now for the tiebreaker. Gentlemen, you will write your answers. What year was the submarine first used as a military weapon? Write your answers. Wayne says, 1938. Oh my goodness. Stu says, 1776. And the answer is September 7th, 1776. Yes, the very first submarine attack was in New York Harbor against the HMS Eagle, which was the flagship of the British Navy under Admiral Howe. It was just 11 days after their victory in the Battle of Long Island. The submarine was completely man-powered and known as the Turtle. Congratulations to Stu Cook, our new You Can Look It Up champion. That's all the time we have for today, folks. Thank you for playing You Can Look It Up, the game where you don't know what you don't know. And remember, don't take our word for it when... You Can Look It Up! And now it's time for Did You Know? Did you know that Thomas Jefferson and John Adams died on the exact same day? Both died on July 4th, 1826. That's 50 years to the day after the signing of the Declaration of Independence. Did you know that James Monroe died on the 4th of July, 1831, exactly five years after the death of Adams and Jefferson? Did you know that Calvin Coolidge, the 30th President of the United States under the Constitution, was born on July 4th in 1872? Thanks for spending time with the We The Kids Liberty Players! We want to invite everyone from 8 to 108 to listen and please join us on We The Kids radio show and to hear more forgotten stories. Learn the principles of freedom that established unprecedented freedom in America so that we can all, whether we're 8 or 108, preserve our freedom. Mm -hmm.